Hey everyone, it's Dr. Marcon, and this is chapter 18 on reproduction and development. Uh, before we get into chapter 18, however, I just wanted to go over really quick on uh, finishing up on meiosis, which we talked about in the last chapter. Here we see our typical karyotype or picture of the chromosomes that make us who we are. So the last thing we kind of talked about in the last chapter is what happens when chromosomes don't separate normally. We talked about something called non-disjunction, and this is when chromosomes fail to separate, and it can happen in one to two, one or of two ways. And in these pictures, we can kind of see what happens when we have non-disjunctions. For example, uh, the products of meiosis, one of the gametes has one extra chromosome while the other gamete is missing one. And when we look at uh, the karyotype, we can see that there is an extra chromosome here at uh, 21 causing trisomy 21, also known as Down syndrome. So we talked about non-disjunction and there are one of two ways that non-disjunction can occur. First, we can have a normal meiosis one, where we have uh, the equal number of chromosomes in the two daughter cells, but we can have an abnormal meiosis two. So as you can see with an abnormal second meiotic division, there will be one additional chromosome in one of the four cells, whereas another cell will have one missing, and then the last two will have a normal number of chromosomes. And the second type of non-disjunction, you could have an abnormal meiosis 1, but normal meiosis 2. So here we have non-disjunction at meiosis 1, where we can see that uh, the second daughter cell is missing a pair of chromosomes, where the first uh, daughter cell has a, an extra. And what will happen is you'll have two gametes having one additional chromosome, whereas the other two gametes will be missing uh, one chromosome after a normal second meiotic division. We talked about trisomy 21, also known as Down syndrome, where there is an extra chromosome at uh, location 21 and this of course causes the the symptoms of down syndrome you can see the specific uh, facial features of a patient with down syndrome uh, there may or may not be a level of mental retardation um, and depending on the severity of a, the condition they may or may not be functional but can you explain how this can happen? Uh, this is something that you should definitely review in your notes. So now we get into the reproductive system. What is the purpose of our reproductive system? Of course, it's to continue the human species, but how does this happen? It happens by producing, storing, and transporting our sex cells. We know that reproductive system development begins soon after fertilization. Now, the formation of organs or organogenesis usually begins around uh, week eight, uh, age of, of gestation. All developing fetuses start with gonads, tubes, and mounds. So both sexes will have a pair of gonads, and of course these gonads will uh, are needed to produce gametes. Males have testes, whereas females have ovaries uh, eventually. Um, both sexes will have ducts or tubes that will store and deliver the gametes um, that are produced by the gonads. And other structures um, are present, structures such as mounds, which will help facilitate copulation or the sexual act. So here we see uh, a front or anterior view um, of our gonads, testes in males, ovaries, and females. So before the fetus it, uh, becomes differentiated, it's known as undifferentiated. So again, uh, we have rudimentary structures that will form the gonads, we have ducts, uh, there's the Wolfian duct and the Malarian duct.
Now, if the fetus is fated to become male, the Wolfian duck will actually give rise to the male reproductive organs. Whereas if the fetus is uh, determined to become a female, uh, the malarian duck will then give rise to the female reproductive organs, such as the, uh, the fallopian tubes and the uterus. So here we see differentiation of uh, the gonads as well as these ducts. Um, we can see that uh, the male gonads are the testes and the ducts uh, include the vas deferens. Uh, we also have other um, organs, male organs such as the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, and the ejaculatory ducts. Whereas in females, uh, the female gonads are the ovaries and uh, ducts include the fallopian tube which will allow for uh, passage of the, uh, the egg to the uterus. So the tubes that we are talking about in males, we have the vas deferens, which allow for transport of the male gametes, the sperm specifically, uh, into um, the ejaculatory duct. And then for the ducts in females, we have the oviducts, also known as the fallopian tubes in females, again, allowing for passageway of the female gamete or the ova or egg. We can see that um, at nine weeks gestation, both the male and female reproductive organs don't really look that different at nine weeks. Um, if you use the numbers to kind of uh, figure out uh, the structures that will eventually become the different uh, reproductive organs, uh, we can see in the upper uh, most picture, four will become is will become the genital tuber or the glans penis. Uh, and eight are the labial scrotal folds, whereas in the lower picture, um, it doesn't ver look very much different from the uh, male fetus at nine weeks. However, by 11 or 13 weeks, we can finally see uh, some of those structures starting to develop. So for example, three will eventually become the clitoris, whereas four will become the labia scrotal folds or the labia majora, uh, depending if it's male or female. So here we see the glans penis uh, in the male fetus, as well as uh, the scrotal folds, which are numbered at eight. And then in the lower pictures, we can see that the labia majora is starting to develop um, on the sides of the clitoris, which is number three, uh, at 17 weeks. And by 20 weeks, we definitely have uh, a pretty obvious... Um, female reproductive external anatomy with the clitoris, um, which is labeled three, and the uh, labial folds at number four. So we can usually identify the sex of the fetus at about 12 weeks. That's when we can see some obvious external reproductive structures. So the reproductive system development, again, begins soon after fertilization. However, we have the period known as puberty, which marks reproductive maturity. And this is due to an increase in hormones. So we know that puberty is a time of change for everyone. So what are hormones? Hormones are chemical mess messengers that allow different body parts to kind of communicate or talk to each other. And we have many different types of hormones that uh, control uh, our body systems as well as have effects on our mood. And, you know, there are definitely many hormones uh, that I can think of that can not only affect uh, my body, but as well as the mood that I'm in. Um, which ones can you think of? So hormones are released into the bloodstream and then will interact with target cells by binding to proteins or protein receptors. And we have many hormones within our body and produce many different effects. Now the structures or of hormones and receptors um, are like a lock and key system. So hormones bind to the receptors um, because these receptors are very specific for the shape of the hormones. So hormones, we have these large molecules floating around in the bloodstream and they have to fit into uh, a specific receptor. 
in order for that message uh, to be uh, transported to the effector organ. We know that testosterone is a hormone that is produced by the male gonads or the testes. Uh, testosterone is a steroid hormone. Uh, we know that um, it is produced by uh, specific cells within the, the testes known as uh, Leydig cells. And testosterone is one of those hormones that basically um, produce male characteristics in a person. Here we can see the many other organs of the endocrine system. So testosterone causes uh, growth spurts in males by increasing cell division. So here we can see the hormone in, uh, in this green uh, figure binding to eventually um, its receptor. So I'm sorry, the, the red portion is the testosterone and the receptor for testosterone is the green um, that is attached to the bone cell. So once testosterone has bound to its receptor, it will encourage cell division, allowing for more um, bone cells to be produced, causing a growth spurt. So eventually gamete production or production of sex cells slows with age due to a decrease in hormone production. In males, this period no is known as andropause, so a decrease in the amount of testosterone uh, production in males. And with females, it is called menopause, which is when we have a decrease in the amount of estrogen that is produced in the woman's body. <laughs> According to this doctor, many women prefer fear the word menopause, so I prefer to call it puberty part two. And then in males, instead of being called andropause, they call it manopause. Here we can see that testosterone levels do in fact decrease with age. And we can see around 40 years old, we have a um, abrupt decrease in the levels of testosterone in, in males. Estrogen and progesterone, uh, progesterone levels also decrease with age. Um, we can see estrogen having this large decrease around the age of 50 as well as progesterone. Progesterone again being another one of those hormones produced um, by the ovaries. And then here we can see testosterone uh, growth hormone as well as epiendosterone um, levels that are also slowly decreasing with age. And then our melatonin um, levels also decreasing around the age of 50 uh, in females. So yes, testosterone is actually uh, present in both males and females, but in females to a lesser extent. So now we're going to take a look at male reproductive anatomy and we'll take a look at the um, path that um, the sperm will take and then we will look at female reproductive anatomy and the path that the egg will take uh, in those reproductive systems. So we will look at the path of the sperm from production to ejacul ejaculation. Function of the male gonads, of course, is to, and the male reproductive system is to make and deliver sperm. We start off at the testes. Uh, so these are the male gonads, and in the testes, this is where sperm is made. Specifically, uh, the structures are called the seminiferous tubules. And in a little bit, I will show you guys a mnemonic device that will help you remember the path of the sperm. So from the seminiferous tubules contained within the testes, um, the sperm will then travel to the next structure, which is the epididymis. Note the spelling of epididymis, E-P-I-D-I-D-Y-M-I-S. This is uh, where basically sperm are stored and matured. So sperm become motile and are stored here. Here you can see a little uh, uh, picture for sperm swim lessons. So basically this is where the sperm become efficient and faster swimmers where they learn how to swim because they become more motile. 
from the epididymis, uh, the tail of the epididymis, so there's a body head and tail of epididymis, the tail of, of the epididymis is actually continuous with the next structure, which is the vas deferens, also known as the ductus deferens. So from the epididymis, the sperm will then travel to the vas deferens, uh, which will transport the sperm eventually to the urethra. So the sperm will travel uh, from the epididymis uh, to the tail and then up the vas deferens through the spermatocord, uh, traveling then into the pelvic cavity along the lateral sides of the urinary bladder. From the urinary bladder, from, from the posterior portion of the urinary bladder, the vas deferens will then meet up with uh, this gland right here known as the seminal vesicle. So the seminal vesicle, uh, I'll talk about in just a little bit, basically provides the fructose or the sugar for the energy uh, for sperm to, to swim. It's sort of the, uh, the Red Bull for the sperm um, and makes up uh, the majority of the bulk of the, the semen. Um, and from the, uh, the vas deferens, um, it will join with the seminal vesicle to then form this next structure, which is the ejaculatory duct. And we can see the ejaculatory duct uh, located within the prostate gland. Okay, and then from the ejaculatory duct, the sperm will then travel uh, to the urethra. First, of course, the prostatic urethra. Um, so the urethra is the tube within the penis that will transport sperm during ejaculation. Um, and we can see that tube uh, going through the uh, corpus spongiosum, uh, which will then allow for sperm to travel to the penis, which delivers sperm to the female reproductive system. So a good mnemonic that I like to use to help me remember uh, the path of the sperm is 7-up. So S stands for the seven first tubules where sperm is produced within the testes. E stands for epididymis where sperm is stored and matured. The epididymis is then continuous with the next structure which is the vas deferens. The vas deferens travels up the spermatocord into the pelvic cavity along the sides of the urinary bladder where it meets up with the seminal vesicle and then forms the next structure which is E, the ejaculatory duct. Okay, and we can see the ejaculatory duct contained within uh, the prostate which is that gland that also has secretions that contribute to the bulk of semen. N stands for nothing, uh, it's just a filler, but then the next structure is U, the urethra. Okay, so from the ejaculatory duct, sperm will enter the prostatic urethra and then uh, travel into the spongy urethra within the corpus spongiosum of the penis. And then from there, from the urethra, uh, sperm will then travel out the pe penis. So 7-Up helps you remember the path of the sperm from uh, its production in the testes through the various tubes. Um, and then out the penis. Okay, so seven up. Sperm cannot survive on their own. Uh, that is why uh, male, the male reproductive system will produce semen. And semen is made up of sperm plus the secretions from glands. And we talked about some of the glands already. So there are three glands. We have the seminal vesicles that basically provides the fructose or the energy. It gives it uh, gives it wings, like Red Bull gives it wings. Um, we have the prostate gland that will secrete fluid to help raise vaginal pH. So basically, it um, takes away the acidity of the any remnants of urine that might be within the urethra, as well as um, taking away the acidity of the environment within the vagina to give a more favorable environment for the sperm to be in. And then we have the bubble urethral glands. So the bubble urethral glands help um, l makes lubricating mucus, which also cleanses the urethra from any uh, remnants of uh, acidic urine. So these three glands um, help with the production of uh, the bulk of semen, um, so that uh, providing an environment for sperm to survive.
So some fun facts. As always, there are fun facts with the male reproductive system. Um, the volume of semen per ejaculation is about one teaspoon. Um, and there are anywhere between 200 to 500 million sperm per ejaculation. And sperm only make up about 1% of the total volume of semen. And we know that uh, the sperm can survive um, about four to five hours in the female vagina, but can survive up to five days in the uterine or fallopian tubes. So if you are counting your days, ladies, make sure you take that fact into account, especially if you know uh, when your ovulation is within your cycle. So we talked about external uh, reproductive anatomy. We have um, the penis. We know that the penis delivers sperm to the female reproductive system. Uh, it's made up of um, cavernous or spongy tissue uh, that uh, are basically uh, erectile tissue. So certain contains erectile spongy tissue as well as veins, arteries, and um, the urethra. So the two uh, cavernous bodies that are on the dorsal aspect of the penis, uh, those are the corpora cavernosa. And then the spongy cavernous body is also known as the corpus spongiosum. And that uh, corpus spongiosum is what contains the urethra, which is the tube uh, that acts as the passageway for sperm. So empty spaces will fill the blood surrounding the urethra um, for sperm release during ejaculation. So we know that these cavernous bodies fill up with blood to allow for an erection to occur. And of course, um, we have various drugs um, that aid in the uh, erection process. So um, in males, there is a dysfunction known as erectile dysfunction in which uh, the male patient has the inability to achieve or maintain an erection. And usually causes can be psychological, um, they can be physical, and are, can be due to uh, lifestyle um, factors that can cause uh, this condition. So actually one in four men will experience some form of erectile dysfunction by age 30. Um, and, and this is out of the 40 million men in the U.S. Uh, who have experienced erectile dysfunction. So a very well-known drug uh, is Viagra that actually treats erectile dysfunction. Um, it works by um, increasing blood flow to the penis to help prolong the effects of nitric oxide. So during arousal, nitric oxide is released that causes the widening of the arterioles or the blood vessels uh, within the penis. With increased blood flow to the penis, this is what causes erection. So increased blood flow within those cavernous bodies causing an erection. So Viagra increases blood flow to these areas. So now that we've talked about the pathway of the sperm in the male reproductive system, we're now going to talk about the female reproductive system and the pathway of an egg, which is the female gamete. So we know that the female reproductive system, its function is to produce eggs as well as support pregnancy. So here we see an anterior view of the internal uh, reproductive, female reproductive system structures. So we have the female gonads also known as the ovary. This is where we have oocyte or female gamete production. We then have the fallopian tubes um, or oviducts, and this is where once the egg has been ovulated, uh, it will then travel into the fallopian tubes, and it is within the fallopian tubes that the majority of fertilization takes place, fertilization being when the sperm meets up with the egg. So the majority of fertilization takes place in the fallopian tubes, specifically the ampulla. Um, which is this portion of the fallopian tube. And once the egg has been fertilized, it will then travel along the fallopian tube into the uterus. 
So the uterus um, is an important organ, also known as the womb. This is where we have development of the embryo and the fetus. Part of the, the uterus um, is the opening, which is known as the cervix. So the cervix uh, serves as the opening of the uterus um, and is the barrier between the uterus and the long tube known as the vagina. So the vagina is also known as the birth canal. This is a muscular tube that opens to the outside of the body. So unlike the male reproductive system, uh, there is no crossover with the urinary system uh, within females. So the urethra is not used as part of the uh, female reproductive system. So uh, we will take a look at the uterus uh, being a very important structure for the development of the fetus. So um, internally, the uterus has two layers. We have the innermost layer being the endometrium. Uh, this is the lining of the uterus, um, and uh, this is where implantation of the fertilized egg occurs. If there is no fertilization of the egg, this is the lining that sheds off once a month during menstruation. And then we have the thick, smooth muscular layer, that middle muscular layer known as the myometrium. So here is that muscular layer known as the myometrium. Um, has a smooth muscle whose contractions allow for expulsion um, of uh, the baby once it is time for childbirth. We talked about um, female gametes and how the supply of eggs within a female, um, the, the full number of eggs that a woman will have is present at birth. However, this number does decline with age. So at birth, most females have about 2 million eggs. And we know that the ability to release these eggs does begin at puberty. So by puberty, um, a female will only have about 400,000 eggs. By age 30, this number declines to about 100,000. And once a woman has reached menopause, usually between uh, the ages of 45 to 55, uh, there are no more, no more available eggs and reproductive ability ends here at menopause. So what could happen to the egg? So the first possibility is um, once a month when the egg is ovulated, uh, the egg is not fertilized. So here we see ovulation of the egg that is chosen once a month going into the fallopian tube. If no fertilization takes place, the egg and the uterine lining will be shed during menstruation. So here we see the, that endometrium. No fertilization, meaning the egg will not implant into that endometrial wall, and therefore uh, menstruation occurs. And then um, if there's no fertilization, this process of um, ovulation will repeat the next month based on specific hormonal signals. So then the egg is discarded. Bye-bye. So what's another possibility? The egg is fertilized. So again, we know that fertilization usually takes place within the fallopian tube, specifically the ampulla of the fallopian tube. Uh, if fertilized, the egg will then fully develop and implant in the uterus, hopefully. Um, usually you'll, you'll have chemical signals and hormones um, being secreted by the ovary to tell the female body that it is pregnant and will stop ovulation from occurring uh, the next month. So the lining of the uterus, known as the endometrium, will thicken with blood uh, and mucus in preparation for a fertilized egg. And hopefully the egg stays in the uterus um, and this fertilized egg will hopefully become a normal, healthy baby. So we can recall that the female reproductive goals are to produce uh, the egg as well as support pregnancy. And we know that timing is very and a very important part of reaching this goal. 
So how does the female reproductive system achieve its goals? Uh, we have what's known as the menstrual cycle. So every month an egg will mature and it will be released from the ovary. This is known as ovulation. At the same time, the uterus is preparing for a fertilized egg. Um, and these two cycles together are called the menstrual cycle. So we have the ovarian cycle where we have the maturation of uh, an, an egg um, and then ovulation of this egg. So the one that is chosen to be ovulated um, will then go through that ovarian cycle. And then we also have the uterine cycle where the lining of the uterus prepares itself for the, uh, the fertilized egg. So we can see we have different phases with the uterine cycle. Uh, we have the menstrual phase, that's the first part of the uterine cycle, uh, when there is no implantation from the previous cycle. Uh, and once menstruation has uh, finished, the lining of the uterus will then start um, proliferating or uh, preparing itself for a fertilized egg by increasing its blood supply as well as the tissue within that lining. So hormones are key to the coordination of these two cycles. So the brain and ovaries will talk to each other via hormones to, contr to control the menstrual cycle. So we have um, different hormones that are released by the pituitary gland hormones known as uh, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which control the menstrual cycle. And the ovaries produce estrogen as well as progesterone. And uh, like I said previously, the hormones from the pituitary gland, the luteinizing hormone, as well as the follicle stimulating hormone uh, will coordinates with the ovaries for the production of estrogen and progesterone. So we can actually see um, how this works a little bit more closely, especially when we want to talk about uh, birth control. So birth control is intentionally preventing fertilization um, and there actually has been uh, a study done or um, male forms of birth control that are available although i have not known any male patients to take any uh, hormonal birth control uh, usually they do uh, surgical methods such as uh, vasectomies, but I, I have not encountered a patient taking uh, male birth control. So we have different uh, methods of birth control. We have uh, surgical methods or surgical sterilization. In males, we have a vasectomy where the vas deferens is cut and sealed on both sides. And then we have tubal ligation where we have cutting of the fallopian tubes or tying of the tubes to prevent uh, the passage of the egg um, to meet up with the, uh, the sperm. Then we have hormonal methods. Um, for example, we have IUDs that release uh, specific hormones to prevent fertilization. We have our over-the-counter pills. Um, we also have... Uh, uh, injectables, we have um, Depo-Provera, so, you know, these are all ways of uh, in, pr introducing uh, hormones to the female body to prevent uh, fertilization, um, sometimes to kind of trick the body into thinking that it's pregnant so that ovulation does not occur. Um, and then we also have other physical methods such as barrier methods with the use of condoms, female condoms, um, and we have uh, the intrauterine devices uh, that are implanted into uh, the female uterus that also uh, release uh, specific hormones preventing uh, ovulation or fertilization. So what factors do you think can contribute to infertility? So infertility is defined as the inability to conceive after a year of trying. Uh, one factor that can cause infertility, we have abnormally shaped sperm, which contributes to male infertility. Here we can see in normal, 
uh, sperm, and then we have, you know, giant sperm with a giant uh, acrosomal head. We have smaller sperm. We have um, uh, a sperm that might have a double head or a double body. And all these abnormally shaped sperm contributes to male infertility. Also, we know that the testes uh, where sperm is stored and matured is actually located within the scrotum, which um, the location of the scrotal sac is um, anterior to the body, which allows for um, cooling of the testes because uh, ideal conditions for tests for sperm to be produced is usually about one or two degrees cooler than normal body temperature. So when we talk to males about infertility, we often tell them, you know, don't have a laptop, don't have anything warm or have any warm drinks around um, the scrotal area because if you have uh, a temperature that uh, is higher than the ideal temperature, you will not have uh, ideal conditions for sperm production. And then we talk about ways to enhance fertility. For example, we have artificial insemination um, of a fertilized egg or embryos into uh, the uterus. If we know that there is some sort of um, uh, physical uh, uh, way that the female cannot get pregnant, we, what we do is we uh, allow, we take her eggs and, or collect her eggs and then, um, we take that um, and then uh, take a sperm donor or the sperm of her uh, significant other um, and we can inseminate that into her uterus. Um, in vitro fertilization is basically uh, that, um, that way that we can uh, enhance fertility. So uh, we take a test tube, we introduce an egg to sperm, allow for fertilization to occur in an embryo to develop and then again implant that into the uterus. And so uh, we give the female patient uh, hormones to kind of uh, uh, encourage ovulation and we collect the eggs uh, that are viable and then uh, fertilize within test tube and um, implant those embryos within the uterus. It's a very expensive procedure but usually it's recommended for patients that are high risk, that have, you know, especially for a female patient who's had a number of miscarriages, uh, has any physical defects that prevent her from ovulating, has had a history of, um, of miscarriages as well as ectopic pregnancies, or is a geriatric patient, someone who is above the age of 35. Um, these are all uh, conditions in which we encourage um, either artificial insemination or in vitro fertilization. So everyone, that is the chapter on uh, reproduction and development, um, as well as uh, sort of an introduction to male and female reproductive anatomy.